Welcome to the December webinar of the conference on reproducibility and replicability and economics and social sciences. So thank you for joining us today. Before I introduce the panelists, I wanted to tell you a little bit, a little bit about CRESS. Our goal with the conference on reproducibility and replicability in economics and the social sciences is to provide a consistent series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. Over the course of the next year, we will have panels discussing educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. I would also like to introduce uh, Marie Connolly, a member of our organizing committee, together with Ian Schmutt, who could not be here today, and host of some future webinars, and Sarah Brooks, who keeps the wheels rolling. They'll be on mute for most of the panel, but Marie will be monitoring the Q&A and relay any questions. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar, Reproducibility and Confidential or Proprietary Data. Can it be done? We look forward to hearing from our expert panelists and for your questions. Each panelist will start with a brief statement, followed by a discussion here on the podium. At the 40 minute mark, we will turn to audience questions. To submit a question, please type it into the Q&A and we will pose your question to our speakers on your behalf. Without further ado, let's introduce our panelists. Today, we're joined by three panelists, John Horton, who is professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research focuses on the intersection of labor economics, market design, and information systems. He worked for two years as staff economist for ODesk, an online labor market. He has a BS in mathematics from West Point and a PhD from Harvard University. Paulo Guimarães is the head of the microdata laboratory of Banco de Portugal, which makes confidential data available to non-bank researchers and is, an and is an invited professor at the University of Porto. His interests lie in the application of econometric techniques to large data sets. Varsville Huber is an economist at Cornell University, executive director of the Labor Dynamics Institute. He is the American Economic Association's data editor, where he monitors compliance with the journal's data and code policy and is on advisory boards for French and Canadian restricted access research data centers. Uh, so let, let's start off. A uh, question to you, uh, John Horton. Uh, what should researchers focus on when using confidential or proprietary data from private providers? On the flip side, what do private providers usually look for when making these agreements with researchers and how much does reproducibility play into that? Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the question. Um, you know, I, I think I, I do have some slides that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some of these things. I think what I kind of look at this is about is, you know, you're trying to uh, not trick yourself and not trick the public that's consuming your research. And I think part of this is even if you can't share the data, structuring your code and sort of how you actually do the craft of research in such a way that it builds credibility is, is important. And then you kind of have this kind of stage where you can try to haggle with the data provider to release as much as you possibly can. And so I, I have some slides on, on uh, you know, how, you might, how you might approach that. So I kind of think of it as sort of, there's like a crafty part of this of, of kind of setting yourself up for reproducibility and then you know, what can you do to actually get more of that data um, into the public? I, I think I'll talk more about what, what uh, I think companies actually care about. That's maybe a little bit different from say public sector institutions, but I think right now it's probably good. I can switch to my slides and yeah. So, uh, you know, I, like I said, I think I've kind of two things I want to talk about some opinionated views on software development practices. And then the, the second part is getting companies to make uh, data or at least more data public. So I think the, the software side of this is, I, I think the goal is something like push button reproducibility, right? You take from the raw data that you got all the way to the paper that's, that's written at the end with no sort of human fiddling along the way. And I, I think there's really like two reasons you want to do this. Uh, you know, one is you don't trick others with your flawed research. And, and the second is that you don't trick yourself with your flawed research. Uh, that some like building up these practices actually promotes correctness and makes it less likely that you're going to make errors. So it's, it's, um, 
you know, I think there's kind of three things that I think are, are good principles to, to be thinking about. Um, one is making all your dependencies explicit, sort of how all the data and code work together, uh, organizing your code in a, in, a, in a way that promotes reproducibility. And I think modularity is sort of the key thing. And then, um, you know, I think part of this idea is can this work somewhere other than just my laptop? And so how do you get things to work on other people's computers? I think the dependency aspect of this, this is actually a close to a solved problem in software engineering, which is you can use uh, their software approaches to map out dependencies. So this is a, a make file. It's a little bit confusing if you've never seen it before, but the basic idea is really simple. You're essentially writing out the recipe for your code or your report uh, in code where you say, you know, this is the thing that I'm trying to, to create. Here it's some average wages by category. Um, that's the thing you're making. And then you have the, the recipes, uh, sorry, the, the ingredients, what goes into that, which here is both code and some data. And then finally, the recipe, which is this is the thing that actually creates that, that outcome. And what's nice is you can actually ladder this all up uh, to build the final paper that you have that's composed of all these individual components. And what I think this buys you is you get perfect transparency on how the, the paper is made. You can go from raw data all the way to final output. And in principle, this makes it actually very easy for someone to reproduce your paper. They could, in principle, copy the data that you use, unzip it, and uh, run make and, and sort of execute everything. Well, you know, and in practice, it's not as easy as I'm describing. It'll throw a lot of errors. Uh, but I think that this is good, and it actually makes your project stronger. And, you know, what about, say, like, callouts and text? Well, you can actually do that, too. Like, a, this is from a recent paper of mine where you know, we have a kind of a headline number in the parameter. And rather than hard coding that into the text, it's also a, a reproduced artifact where there's code that generates it. And then it kind of plugs it in as a parameter. Well, you know, you might be thinking like, hey, I didn't, I didn't become an economist because I wanted to be a software engineer. Um, I think if you're doing empirical work, you're, you're a software engineer, whether you, whether you sort of want to be or not. And, you know, I think in the long run, this actually ultimately saves time. You know, it reduces the chance of, of making errors. It makes it kind of easy to kind of remember how things worked. Um, you know, Lars could talk about this, but sometimes journals don't get back to you right away. And if you've kind of forgotten how things work, having it documented actually is, is nice. Um, you know, one, one, I think, kind of knock you get on reproducibility is like, boy, you know, this is software that's really only going to be run once. Is this really worth all this effort? Uh, and, and I think that's kind of the wrong way to think about it. There's a lot of cases where the software is critically important, even if it's only going to be run once. And I think of most of our research is, is like that. It's, it's a big payoff to actually getting that. Um, I think another thing that can, can be very helpful here is just modularity, where you kind of split things up into to pieces. So if things fail, they fail as kind of small pieces. So, you know, my workflow is I, I like to take and create one uh, figure or table has one associated R Python script. Um, if it's something complicated, I kind of break it into pieces. So if, if something breaks, I have a much better chance of kind of just isolate, isolating it to that, uh, to that one piece. Now, you know, what does this have to do with sort of trust in your research? Well, you know, the, the truth is for some very sensitive proprietary data, it's going to be very difficult for you to release it, um, e even, even small chunks of it, perhaps. And I think why this kind of push button rec replicability matters is it, it does build confidence. Like you've, you've orchestrated things so that it's clear that you don't have a, a card up your sleeve. Anyone could look at your code and see, okay, if this raw data was here, this is the process that, that it goes through where you know, you're not worried about someone kind of fiddling along the way or sort of making hand, hand adjustments or something like that or some mistake that's, that's sort of driving the results. Um, you know, Lars could probably talk a lot more about this, but, you know, the, one of the big challenges is even if you can get everything to work on your own computer, getting it to work on other people's computers is a, is a kind of an unsolved problem. You know, there's some nice things you can do with, with virtual environments. Um, over time, I've tried to, to kind of limit my use of kind of esoteric packages to kind of prevent code rot. Um, if you do have to use external packages that, that may kind of fail over time, I think being parsimonious and loading in packages so you're only kind of using just the external code you need for one particular thing is nice, uh, kind of related to that principle of modularity. 
And you know, if you, one kind of first thing you could do is just if your computer, your co-authors are using different machines, that's that's often very very helpful. Um, okay, so then you know, what about getting the data itself, which I think is is kind of a a big question. Um, I think I say organizations here. I guess I probably mean more for-profit firms. Um, for them, sharing raw data is scary. Um, they're they're worried about a couple things. Um, they're worried about bad press. So they're thinking maybe there's some gotcha that's in the data, um, some something in there that's going to make them look bad. And if you're you know releasing millions of observations of something and you know. Uh, heaven help you if there's like some free text in there or something. Uh, that that's kind of a concern. They're obviously worried about leaking private and confidential data. Even if you've kind of said it's been scrubbed, is it is it really all all not there? Um, and then sometimes they worry about things like competitive intelligence. You know, most firms have have competitors, and you know, are you going to be releasing something that might, you know, might give an an edge to a competitor? Um, and, and I think really the, the, the problem is that they actually see very little upside, right? Uh, you know, you as a researcher, you may benefit from making data public if it leads to, you know, more citations or more interest in your work, but uh, the firm, you know, probably not. And so I, I think what I think you have to do is one, think about how to minimize the risk to them. Um, there are definitely things that um, firms care a lot about, like, you know, Things like margin or growth or something like how how a feature or some, some part of their business is doing that you know you don't care about at all, um, and there's things that you care about that they don't care about, and so I think that's where you kind of negotiate. Uh, that that's like the sweet spot for negotiation, um, and I think you know you have to because it's mostly risk for them. I think you have to kind of truthfully explain what the benefits are, and I I think one is. Um, firms form these academic collaborations because they get some benefit from them. And I think you can make your continued work and engagement um, somewhat contingent upon data sharing if, if you know you, you can kind of negotiate here. In terms of like haggling or negotiating, one thing that you can do is is I, I think there's kind of a spectrum of data sharing. Like ideally you'd produce the raw data that you use in your paper. Um, Okay, well, what if I can remove some identifiers or drop a drop a column that may have identifiers in it of some kind? Uh, are, you know, are there aggregates of the data that I can share? Uh, what about demean data? Like, if you're doing panel stuff, um, you know, those fixed effects are mostly a nuisance for you anyway. Can you share a data set where you've already stripped that sort of stuff out? Um, another thing too is with a. a a, there's a mismatch, I think, between researchers and academics in terms of like what's considered a long time. Uh, if if you know you want to say you ran an experiment this year, that may have some kind of competitive intelligence or or kind of it's in the news and the firm may get get kind of a little bit fearful. Uh, but if you're talking about stuff in you know a year, two years, five years, twenty years, you know I I hopefully if nothing happens to me, I hope to still be doing a, a, you know research in twenty years and. And the data that I've collected now, I could imagine still being useful in 20 years. So possibly you could you could negotiate for a release in the future um, that would still help. Uh, I, I, one thing that I've been kind of interested in lately, and I really haven't explored it much, but in, in the business world, there's a lot of interest in synthetic data, where you take a real data set and then generate synthetic data that's, that has some, in some sense, like the same properties as that real data. Um, I'm just kind of getting my toe, uh, sipping my toe in the water here with this, but I think this might be an interesting kind of half measure between releasing real data and not releasing any data at all. Um, but I, I'm, you know, kind of curious about that. Uh, so, all right, thanks. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you, John. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. There are a couple, I was actually uh, right in the middle of writing down a question to ask you about synthetic data. Uh, yeah. Where sort of private providers have been using that um, <clears throat> because it's it's relatively recent, especially with these like the Susan Athey uh, work that's been going on. Um, also something that resonated with me was this idea that as economists, uh, you know, just, uh, we're not software engineers, right? Um, which I think as soon as you do pick up uh, programming language, you sort of have to think about a little bit about software engineering uh, 
And I certainly feel a lot more trust in the code that someone writes if the code is more modular and it's kind of like commented because it shows me that they've also kind of minimized their chances of making a mistake, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think if you can kind of think of any complex empirical project as like a pretty substantial software engineering project. And, you know, the, the discipline of software engineering has been around for a while and they figured out a lot of things. Like if you kind of look at like what their best practices are, um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel as economists, we can kind of lean on a lot of the experience that people have had making complex software for, for years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, kind of the presentations that I've been doing in workshops is really just re kind of regurgitating a lot of software engineering stuff uh, to terms that sort of researchers can understand. Um, well, you know, again, thank you, John. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Now onto uh, Paolo. Uh, BPLIM provides access uh, to confidential administrative data to many researchers. Uh, what can researchers rely on uh, if reproducible analysis is asked for, for instance, by data editors like Lars and Marie? And how do you manage that with your team organizationally and technically? So I'd like to uh, invite Paolo now to uh, answer or present if you have any slides. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for, for the opportunity too. I mean, uh... So what, what we're going to be doing is, uh, what I'm going to be doing is just uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our experience at Bepilim. And, uh, and, and so let's start with a little bit of context. <clears throat> Bepilim is recent. It was established in 2016 and is part of the economics and research department at the bank. And when it was established, the main objective was just one, is to make sure that the excellent micro data sets that are available at the Bank of Portugal could be uh, accessed by external researchers. I mean, to, and th that was the main objective. So Bank of Portugal over the years has collected very rich data sets. I mean, they are administ administrative data sets, uh, the typical administrative data sets, uh, the uh, universal, they have many years. Uh, to give an idea, for example, uh, the credit, the central credit register, uh, is a um, is a monthly collected data set of all credits that are held by financial institutions over firms and individuals. If the amount of the credit exceeds fifty euros, so you can see it's millions and millions of records. But of course, they contain sensitive information, and since they contain sensitive information. Uh, we could not use the usual, the usual formula of just making the data available. So the common solution for uh, making confidential data available at other research data centers was simply to have a secure computing environment, just uh, let researchers accredit researchers come and analyze the data on site. The, the, that solution was not, uh, we didn't like that solution, let, let me put it that way, simply because it would limit access to the researchers that could come to the bank's premises. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that if we had an approach that any researchers from anywhere could use the, the, the data sets at the bank. And there were also some legal concerns on our side about access to the data and the fact that researchers could use or could be analyzing the original data sets. So the solution that we ended up adopting at Bepilim was uh, based on a set of principles. First, <clears throat> we had to make sure that access was exclusively for scientific purposes and free of charge. All the data that had to be analyzed had to be, all, all analysis had to be done at the servers of the bank. We could not let the data out. We had to provide uh, remote access to the data. And the data sets that we had, some of them were classified as low confidentiality and others at medium or high confidentiality levels. This is a scale that we, 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 we created. And of course, since we are talking about confidential data, uh, in our interpretation, this will be medium or high confidentiality level uh, data sets. 
it was also uh, decided that all these type data sets, I mean, medium or high confidentiality level, they had to be perturbed. I mean, what researchers could work with was not the original data, but some modified data set. Uh, of course, we didn't go on synthetic data, but it's just a modified data that has the same structure. It, it, for example, it preserves the missing data, preserves the zeros, has the same variables, the same number of observations. Uh, even though it, uh, it, it may seem like a very, uh, that this is limitative, what we committed to was that we would run, BPLIM staff would run all scripts that the researchers created on the original data. So just to get an idea of what's uh, the standard way of uh, operating, I mean, once a project is submitted to BPLIM and it's accredited, the researchers are accredited, we open an account in an external server that can be accessed from anywhere. The researcher has access to a folder. In that folder, there are four subfolders. The, the, the initial data set subfolder is a read-only folder. That's where we place the data. In this case, if it's confidential data, it is modified data sets. The tools is where we place any packages that the researcher needs for it, its analysis. It's also a read-only uh, folder. So, uh, and then there is the work area. That's where the researcher can write and read, uh, and that's where you, you will work. And finally, the, 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 the other folder results, it's where uh, it can put any output that he wants extracted and so that we can uh, do a standard verification for before we can release it. To the to the researchers, so there are there is no possibility of uh, file transfers to and from the server. Installation of packages has to be requested, and the researcher has available Stata, R, Python, and Julia. So these are the typical software that's used in economics, as we said, I know of. To if the researcher is working with confidential data, so this is how it works. He gets access to the portal data set, he implements this code, then he generates some preliminary results. After he generates his preliminary results, he asks us to replicate it on the original data. Before we do so, we have to be able to generate the same results that the researcher did. If we are able to do so, then we implement the code on the original data. If not, I mean, we simply ask him to review his code and because we weren't able to reproduce the, the data. So our experience so far is this is this works and it's a bit cumbersome because uh, uh, it ends up, we have to do it on our side. So the research codes, then on our side, we have to replicate these results and then we have to run it again on the original data. It ends up being an exercise on reproducibility using the perturbed data. And of course, if it works well on the perturbed data, I mean, the same code should in principle work well on, on the original data because it's, it's just a matter of changing the data sets that are read, being read. When we start looking at, at this process, then we decided that we, we needed to streamline this process somehow. And researchers, they had what, what they were doing. I mean, their, the, in their research process, we will have a lot of gain, a lot to gain if they could use the best practice on reproducibility. This is because we actually what we were doing was reproducing their work. And, and so we decided to implement a, uh, several initiatives like workshops. We talk directly with them, give them advice. Uh, we supply them templates as much as possible and documentation. And, and also for some of the things that are done recurrently on our data sets, we provide tools, some, uh, some tools that can help them do that work and they don't have to reinvent it. And then on our side, we also, we, we also realized that we could improve our work sequence. And uh, how? 
the way we operate, so the researcher goes to the external server and he codes everything. And then when it when he's done, he asks us to reproduce the result on the original data. So what we have to do is move to a different server, a different place, and to and then try to run his code. So we had we will benefit if the computing environment of the researchers that was used for the replication was the same as one originally used by the researchers. And so we have been promoting the use of singularity containers, at least for open source software, make sure that they use singularity containers because that makes our life so much easier. All we have to do is move the container to, to the other server and replicate the data. And we also have been trying, and this is, we are actually better testing this, which is to shift the burden of this reproducibility check to the researcher. Uh, let me explain uh, what I mean uh, by this. So we have developed a tool, which it's, um, um, for lack of ideas, I call it the BPLIM replication tool. Um, with the idea that the researcher needs to validate his code before we can run it on the original data. So we, we request that he has to produce a master do file and that the script runs from top to bottom, that all files have to be read from that initial data set folder. So any intermediary output files that are creating during have to be created during the replication. And if the this tool runs, it creates a folder where we place in that folder all replication scripts, all output files, and then a file that's created by the software describing the software environment and a JSON file that where all scripts are listed. And this facilitates our life because especially if we are if we have a container and we have the outputs from running this software, all we need to do is with minimal effort, we can replicate the data on, on the original data because we just need to change the paths. Uh, and, and, and basically that's it. We change the paths and we are able to, to run on a different server, the, the replication. So I, I can show you uh, how this works. So, so this is a, a screenshot of the, of the application. So the, the researcher identifies the project that he's working on. He identifies the master, um, the master file that runs all others then he needs to select all the dependencies that he has. And then once he has done that, he simply hits the run button and it will run the project. And, only in, and if it is successful at the end, then we see this is, was a very short run of two minutes, just for an example. And once he's finished, he has an exit code of zero. We, are, we have confirmed that everything ran fine. And so we can move on to the next step and replicate on the original data. And on the process, we generated also all, all the elements for uh, a replication package. I mean, was, was generated in, in, in the process. Uh, if he wants to do it a second time, he can simply load the file, the JSON file, and just modify so he doesn't have to go through the same step again. This is just to give you uh, an idea of this replication uh, process that we've been using with the new all new projects and it works, uh, it, it seems to be working pretty, pretty well. So our goal is that eventually all confidential data that we, uh, that's used at BPLIM for research purposes has to be validated by this script. And we also want to, and we have been doing this uh, with the more recent projects, we want to let the researchers customize their computing environment. What I mean by this is we give them a template for a singularity uh, container. Then we explain them what they need to do, what they need to change. They can test their own container. Once they're happy with the container, they send us a definition file and we build the container for them. And then we know that's the environment where it's gonna be working. Hopefully we, hope to convince all researchers whether or not they are working with confidential data to go through the same process. And this is something, of course, that will take some time. So we know that 
there is no way around this. I mean, confidential data can only be accessed by BPLIM staff. We generate the data. Well, I mean, we, we have digital object identifiers for the data. After the project is closed, we keep the data for uh, 10 years. We want to make sure that everything is transparent. And, and uh, I was actually listening to John and uh, uh, what he was saying was, was really echoing with me. Uh, and in the, so we just want to make sure that everything is transparent in the sense that all the code that we use, we have a GitHub where we place the information, make everything as transparent as possible. The only thing that the researcher cannot access is original data. But we need to realize too that the results with the confidential data, if they have been, if the researcher has produced any results with confidential data, they have at some stage been already reproduced. And this is, I think, that's what we need to make sure that people understand what is the process that the research with confidential data goes through, uh, at least at BPLIM, and take advantage of the fact that we have these conditions. So we can force researchers to generate reproducible research on the whole process of accessing the data. And, 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 I, and I think this can be used to, to our advantage to impose these on, 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 on researchers. Uh, ultimately, of course, this is up to researchers because the fact that we reproduce the data doesn't mean that, I mean, we have no control for what he actually, what results he actually puts on his paper, wh whether or not he fiddles with some of the, the numbers, but at least data editors or whoever wants to verify knows that the data has been reproduced at some point if, uh, if it went through this process. Uh, and and uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and once again, I'm writing a question and uh, the the speaker already uh, mentions it in their presentation. So specifically, I, I have something uh, kind of a similar experience from the uh, perspective of the researcher uh, in uh, kind of doing remote processing uh, in um, Inegi in Mexico. And there, kind of like the thing that you were mentioning before, is that uh, you know every single time you need a dependency or if the code doesn't run, then you have to kind of contact someone in uh, in IT in order for them to to help you, right? Whereas doing everything through singularity containers and doing everything uh, and even letting the researcher uh, you know define the template, I think is 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 a great way to sort of automate things and again to put uh, kind of the burden of reproducibility on the researcher. So very, very, very interesting stuff. Um, so thank you, Paolo. Now, last but not least, uh, Lars Vilhuber, our co-conspirator in Cress, uh, your data editor for the AEA. How do you approach reproducibility ref verification if a manuscript uses confidential data? And what can authors do to make that process smoother? Okay, um, well, one of the things that I can do is, of course, ask Paolo to run the data, uh, but that option isn't available for, for many others. Um, so let me just quickly go through a few slides that I prepared here. Um, and some of this has already been said by both uh, Paolo and by, uh, by John. Um, so um, I'm data editor for the American Economic Association. That's the eight journals here. Uh, Marie, who, for instance, is on the call here as well, is uh, the data editor for the Canadian Journal of Economics. Um, we coordinate, so these are things that are relatively transferable between the journals that have data editors, um, but I'm speaking only for myself here. In a general context, once something exits John's space, Paulo's space, etc., we are at the tail end of the journal, journal process. We get what we call a request for evaluation of a package that is now accepted on scientific merit, because that's what the referees have designated for it to be. And now we're looking at the package and say, does this all fit together, right? There are two things that we focus on. 
One is what most people think of here is, is the report on computational reproducibility. So does this whole thing actually run as designed? I would love for people to listen more to John to have push button reproducibility, but most of them are not exactly at that point. And I'll, I'll get a bit to that. But it's actually just as important. And I'll add this because both Paolo and John have sort of just um, glanced at this at some extent is where does the data come from and who can actually access it? So the way I think of it is not only the computation has to be reproducible, the access has to be reproducible as well. And this question came up in, in one of the QA questions as well. Now, in a case like Paolo's, that is relatively easy. There is a fixed process for this. There are many researchers who are coming to a center that has defined that process. For company data, it becomes way more complicated. And as part potentially of the discussion that John alluded to, how can I make this a long-term relationship? But how can we also figure out how others might potentially access the same or similar data at this. At a minimum, and we have quite a bit of success of doing that, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, can somebody who's not part of my original team access the data and um, under the same conditions that say John had and verify that actually what he's claiming is push button reproducibility actually is. Right. And so we've had a few cases where people have actually incorporated into their data access contract the ability to designate a journal editor to later can access the data or have uh, facilitated access for us signing the same data use agreements with these entities, etc. That tends to be, again, focused at larger firms who have more experience with uh, working with researchers to know what their mindset is, who may even have a staff economist on, on uh, working with them. Um, but it's something also to think about uh, when, when um, co contacting uh, the data. So the typical picture that I draw here is that we're focusing at the journals on reproducibility. That's the maximum that we can check. But we're setting the groundwork for replicability, taking it into other contexts, taking it into other environments, taking it to other firms, taking it to other uh, confidential government data, et cetera, because our ultimate goal is to be able to generalize from the body of research that emerges from this. And we have quite a few, there's a special issue in quantitative economics right now that looks at uh, inequality across the world using many different administrative data done by multiple teams. Uh, there's a paper that is soon to be forthcoming in uh, AR Insights that looks at a single team that ran the same specification on six countries data. These are sort of various ways of doing this. They rely on reproducibility and replicability, right? So um, uh, what drives reproducibility are things like, can the code run again? And is there actually code? But also, is the right data available? Is the same data available that, say, uh, the person before me had? Um, is this specific data, or if I can't access the same specific data, is similar data like that available? Right. And so, reproducible goes to that point as well. If I can't access this company's data, but this company is a provider of something that where there is a marketplace for this. This is not the only person there. Can somebody else go to the competitor and, uh, or or maybe something down the line that is similar and extract the same kind of information? That is extremely valuable. It is also extremely hard to get people uh, to, to provide them because it's hard to provide in, in and of itself. Okay. So John already mentioned a lot of this. Um, transparency is the key thing. It's theoretically a, a highlights or avoids cheating and fiddling with the data, et cetera, manipulations that don't seem right um, and those kinds of things. And we certainly see that going on as well. It reduces the effort for replication, even if nobody else can ever um, access this precise data, but it, replication attempts become cheaper and it allows for expert inspection. Somebody can look at the code and say, this just doesn't make any sense. You did this wrong. And that might be a software engineer who says, the way you do this is going to screw up your stuff. Right. So to run the code, we need access to the data. Okay. Public use data is good. That's the uh, sort of litmus test here. Can this run on public data? But curated access is good. Streamline access to data is, is important. This is where working with government data, despite all its downsides occasionally because it's complex, et cetera, is, is useful because hundreds, thousands of researchers can access the data versus few people can access a specific company's data. Um, we want to know how people got the data. That's where data citations come in. But data citations are not the end all because you kind of want to understand how the complexities of these various access models play out, right? Um, 
it's easy to sort of say, go to this URL and download. That's called open access. It might even involve clicking through a license, then we'll call it public access or something like that. But how do you get access to firm data and how does that intersect with the reproducibility? So we're trying to maximize the amount that people, the amount, number of people who can access the data by making the description as informative as possible, right? Thinking behind the scenes of a threat of entry model, how many people do you need could conceptually access the data and reproduce my analysis so that I am kept honest, right? Um, and things like what Paolo is doing are really important for that because making it easy to reproduce somebody else's um, analysis on Paolo's data is one of the ways to do that, okay? So data citations only tell it where the data comes from. Data availability statements go into a lot more detail. We've got a lot of examples on the website. This is easy when it says go to Paolo's website and click through the application process. It's a lot harder to do this when you're talking about private company data, and it might not be easily reproducible. But things that we look for, for instance, is, well, who should I be talking to at the company? Is that like an outreach officer? Is there a person? I don't necessarily care about the particular person, but whose role is? Who can sign off on this institutionally at the company? That already is valuable information, right? Um, we're pretty good at actually getting access to some of these data. So this just lists some of the um, administrative data that we have, but we, I, I looked at it yesterday. We signed about uh, one data use agreement per week in some fashion over the uh, course of the last year to sort of work on the replication packages at the AEA. Um, so data editors are making some of this work uh, easier because they are the first people to try and re-access some of these data. Um, and that's, can work because we have the code, right? Um, so code here means everything you need to do, the data extraction code, the data cleaning code, because that's where most of the skeletons are hidden most of the time. Uh, it needs to be functional code because that speeds up the whole process, et cetera. So let me just quickly go to some anecdotes and then to some what I think are best practices that can be distilled from this. Um, so I'm anonymizing the not so innocent in this. These are actual statements I've heard, right? So um, John has clearly said, here's what you can do to make work transparent because it is structured in such a way that it's easy to follow. Um, Paolo has said more or less the same thing. Both are sharing code, and yet we still hear way too often that I can't share the code because the data is confidential. Now, the researchers aren't the only ones at, at fault here. Sometimes this comes from, say, company IT security guides or, or things like that. Um, what we also sometimes hear is the agency does not want me to remove the code. Right. And that is almost always wrong. If you're talking about statistical agencies, that is almost always wrong. I have not encountered yet where the code can't be uh, removed. Caveat, some redactions are possible. So those are wrong. Um, I do hear very rarely, I can't share the code because the code is confidential, or it takes way too long to redact the code so that the agency can release it. And that goes back to, I think, John's point earlier on. If you structure your code properly, then that does not become an issue. And so uh, this starts right at the start because doing all this ex post is, is really hard, right? It really is kind of a solved problem anyway, because if there's confidential parameters in the code, if you go to any of the online environments, as John said, these are solutions that have existed for a long time. There are interfaces that will just, you run your code and as it gets all the, it gets to all of the confidential parameters that you've coded in, it just redacts them right out of the log file. And sure, you can circumvent that. It's not foolproof. You can shoot yourself in the foot. That's certainly possible. But these are known solutions. Maybe this should be a feature of Stata, SAS, R, et cetera, that runs in these kinds of environments that we sort of toggle on confidential mode and we've designated these are secrets and you shouldn't show them. Not sure. I can certainly see this as being really useful if it were implemented in some of these environments. Right. Um, as a simple example, I don't know how much time we have left. Um, say this is an example I, I, I teach. I'll have a link to it in, at the end. Um, this would be census data relying on tax data. A lot of these things, this is made up this stuff, but in that particular context, many variables are deemed confidential. Uh, seeds might be deemed confidential, things like that. How does this look like if you actually redact the code? You make the code non functional. What we have seen this code so many times. This code now no longer works when you run it, and it no longer works when somebody else wants to run it. So how should one go about doing this a bit more uh, structurally? Well, create a file that contains all those confidential parameters at a minimum, 
right? And then just include some dependencies. Here I've coded them in Stata. You could do them um, in, in, in a make file, uh, but just grab all the things that you're told you can't release and stick them into a separate file, right? And then you can include that and take care with the logs, maybe make it silent, something like that, okay? The other thing, and this is a bit more, uh, this is sort of handled for you if you're working with uh, statistical agency data, but take company data that you've received. What can you release? John emphasized the point, you're trying to release as much as possible, but um, it's not just because you've added noise that now you can go ahead and publish it because you think you can publish it. Keep talking to the folks who gave you the data in the first place, because this is not necessarily a decision you can make on your own. Um, so. Um, I have, these are quotes that said, I've added the noise to the data, I can now publish it. Turns out to be wrong when you actually ask the people who gave you the data in the first place, right? So keep talking to those data providers, right? And the other thing is that of course, just because you found it, this is the flip side of it, doesn't actually mean that you can post data, right? Again, uh, there are rules around that. We can go into separate discussion about whether or not web scraping gets you the data in a legal way because it's right to use, et cetera. Um, uh, but you don't get to second guess what the provider, uh, whether it be a company that you're working with or whether it be a data provider who makes it available over the internet, et cetera, does these things. Uh, authors have to follow those terms of use. Uh, they end up, uh, impeding reproducibility because we've had to withdraw replication packages because they contain data that they were not supposed to contain, right? And that then breaks it, okay? So those are things not to do as well. So uh, just as a quick summary, um, the full description of the access path gets us reproducibility of access, okay? And that, was, that might not always be the same path, right? So even if Paolo publishes a paper, he has different access to the data than the next researcher. Describing how somebody else can access access to the same data is sometimes an exercise in stepping out and looking through the front door, even though you came in through the back door. Full provision of all the code that gets at the transparency and gets at the potential reproducibility of computation. Even if I can't run it, I can at least conceptually go through it, okay? Taking into account early on any release constraints, trying to maximize what you do, but staying within the bounds of what you're allowed to do and taking that in what you can do that avoids surprises, okay? And combined, I think these make for a more transparent paper and ultimately allow for a greater replicability of the paper in other contexts with other data, et cetera, okay? And I just caution that this is important even for saving time. This is an older story from a while back when it came out that Facebook, which has made efforts to make its data available through the Social Science One, turns out their data processing had an error in it. Software engineering stuff happens, things get detected. And they redraw rule the data. And the comment I want to emphasize here is that people said, oh, this is going to screw up the PhD thesis of my student. In John's world and in my world, if you just say make again, you're only delayed by the time it takes to reprocess the data again, not because you need to in a complicated way, go through a bunch of programs that are, are time consuming, et cetera. That's not a statement just for confidential data. We have seen so many inefficient public use computation practice where I pity the poor PhD student, but this is where you gain yourself from reproducibility. You make yourself, you inoculate yourself against errors like this, that may affect something, whether through somebody else's fault or your own fault, you discover something way up in the pipeline. You have to do everything again, type make and we're done. All right. I'll stop there. Wow, Lars, thank you so much. Uh, I felt like I, you know, I've been guilty of a few of, the, a few of those data misconceptions myself. So it was good to, good to be called out. Um, one, one, one question, maybe this is to, uh, to everybody is whether um, just something coming to mind is, you know, when it comes to confidential data, and we know that authors can't share that data, is there, uh, let's say I do, uh, I do submit to an AEA journal, is there any thought of maybe, maybe this is ambitious, but having some sort of like very restricted NDA DUA uh, with the company that's specifically for replication purposes? Uh, that, uh, you know, it will be restricted to, let's say, data editors or, you know, people that want to replicate uh, so that the 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 data is still confidential and it can be de-anonymized in any way that the company wants, but it is just used strictly for replication. 
So let me start from the journal perspective and then hand over to John from what he sees as feasible within companies' perspectives. We actually try to maximize the amount of access that somebody can get. That includes that intermediate stage that only the data editor can access the data. And there are many scenarios where that is the case, including those where there was broad access and we're some of the last people in through the door who can still access the data, which then no longer becomes available. The Z-Trax Zillow data comes to mind who had a proper program, shut it down, and only those with a foot in the door can still continue doing stuff in scope with our, with our projects. So anything where we can get access to the data is better than nothing because we can at least demonstrate that we got access to this, ran through it, et cetera, and that can be incorporated into agreements. Now, whether or not the company is responsive to that or interested in that, that's a question to John about how, how frequently he's seen that happen. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, a lot of knowledge on, on what, um, what companies would sort of be on board for. I mean, I, you know, just kind of thinking out loud, I imagine what you'd probably want to do is find someone who's likely, like a point of contact at the company that's likely to persist for a long time. You know, there's a lot of turnover in, in most private sector companies. And so, you know, maybe that's the general counsel or, or something like that. I mean, and I, ideally, if you've, you know, been working with that company data, you could leave a nice replication package, like, you know, here's this tarred up archive that has everything you're going to need. Um, you know, that's what you ideally should do. I, I think you could probably narrowly tailor it so that, you know, people can come in. But I, I mean, like, a bit, you know, ultimately what, what you really want is people to build on this research. Like, you know, is this true? Um, and if it's, if it's not, if there's a problem, it would be nice if they had the right to kind of write a comment or, you know, force a, you know, kind of like a further the scholarly dialogue about your, your study. That may be harder to pull off, but you know, that's ultimately what you would, you maybe, maybe just one quick add on to that. One thing that we have seen be amenable, which I think companies should in principle be open to, is you rarely work on the company on the company's data as only yourself. So you need to be able to designate your RAs, your collaborators, etc. One of the ways, occasionally, not always, that we found to be able to access data is we become collaborators for the purpose yeah. of the contract. We're not actually collaborators on the paper, but we are we are actually not even researchers by the terms of the common rule in IRB terms, et cetera, because we don't publish using the data. We just verify that it actually produces the same thing. So becoming a collaborator, the ability to relatively quickly add on an additional person is one way to handle that, right? So that's, that's when the contract is still live. That's nice. Yeah. I, I, so in my academic publication agreements with companies, which, you know, we could have a whole other discussion about that, but one of the clauses that I've included is the right to add co-authors as I see fit. But Lars, now that you bring it up, I probably should say collaborators rather than just co-authors, because it would be nice, uh, yeah, to do exactly that. That would probably be very easy. Like you've reserved that right a ahead of time. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the thought-provoking and interesting material. I will now open up the webinar to questions again. Please enter any further questions you have uh, in the Q&A section. We welcome further in inquiries or uh, queries to a particular panelist or broader questions directed to one or more panelists. Uh, as before, I will be monitoring Zoom chat for questions as well. Uh, so this is actually interesting. The, we have a question from Lars to John. Uh, how often do you work on your computer on your own computer and how often on environments do not control such as a company's computer and how does that affect the ability to show re reproducibility to others uh that's a great question i mean I, this is going to sound really esoteric i i often like ssh to the into the big computer i have in my office to work so i'm very like comfortable working on remote machines i've kind of set it up so that i can like work from my ipad or or whatnot um yeah it's still I, an I, environment you control yeah, it's still an environment I control. I, I mean, like, I think it varies. Like some companies, like, you know, here's a server, have at it. And, you know, you can do whatever you want. Others, you know, they, they're really uptight about, you know, you using their laptop, like their hardware. It, there seems to be a lot of variation in, in practices. You know, I think generally speaking, like the bigger, the more locked down and, and, and tighter, the smaller, it's a bit more loosey-goosey. I'm also thinking in terms of the availability of tools, which also then segues into um, what what various uh, statistical agencies offer. You might not have make in all those environments, right? Yeah, I mean that that I mean that's I mean ideally, 
you know, if you are, if you have to work on the comp, like say a private sector company and you have to work on their servers, um, you know, you're not going to be able to put Stata on very easily. You're not going to like show up with a, you know, a DVD, like, can you put this on this? You know, uh, that would be a good argument for kind of trying to stick to plain vanilla open source stuff that, you know, is going to be easy to install. But yeah, I mean, if the machine's really locked down um, and you can't install things, everything just gets harder. Yeah. Let, let, let me say something. I mean, it's also based on our experience. When uh, <clears throat> we have had a couple of situations where it's a public institutes or uh, and, and even a private uh, company, what they did is they placed the data on our server and we established a protocol with them, making sure that the data would not be released. And so all research is implemented using the same process as we do on our data, but we just um, all the, I, I mean, we just make sure that we have the, put our infrastructure to that use. And, and that has worked well because they trust us that we will not make the data uh, available to anyone else and we'll preserve the confidentiality. So the, of course, this doesn't apply to to a lot of situations, but it's also a, a possibility when it comes to working with, with, with the companies or even other institutions that do not have the possibility of running analysis on the data. So thank you for that. Thank you for that interesting discussion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are at time now, <laughs> um, but uh, all of the rest of the questions we had in the Q&A, we're going to forward them to uh, the speakers today and hopefully they'll uh, go get back to you and you know continue the discussion. Uh, thank you all for attending the CRESS webinar, Reproducibility and Confidential Proprietary Data. Can it be done? I want to thank our speakers, John Horton, Paulo Guimarães, Lars Vilhuber for presenting and our audience members for attending and asking questions. Our next session on January 31st, 2023 at our usual time at 4.15 p.m. Eastern, uh, we will discuss disciplinary support why is reproducibility not uniformly required across disciplines? With Kim Whedon, Betsy Sinclair, and Hilary Hoynes. Uh, and if you happen to be at the Allied Social Sciences meeting in New Orleans, January 6th and 7th, drop by our Coffee with the Data Editor to chat with Lars and his team. Please register, and as always, uh, uh, on our website, uh, which will be in the chat. Uh, we hope to see you there.